Hey guys, you know Lady K Sailing is about getting new people into sailing and trying to make everything easier. And today we're gonna do a beginner's guide on buying a sailboat. Everything from figuring out what you need, what you want, and what you can afford. And we're gonna make it super simple, step by step, so you can come back to these videos anytime in the process. This week on Everything You Need to Know, part one of the beginner's guide to buying a sailboat. You guys know I do a lot of consulting with boat shoppers. It's almost become a full-time job now, and I've been asked everything under the sun about the boat buying process. So we're gonna squish it all down to bite-sized pieces today so that all would-be sailors out there can get it. And if I miss anything, I hope you'll help me out. Please leave a comment below this video to help me help other people get boats and start their sailing adventure. Before we get started, you guys might know I started a second YouTube channel for all the sailing history buffs out there. It's called History Sea, and I just did a new episode yesterday on the biggest, heaviest, greatest ship humankind has ever made and why it sunk. You can check it out up here, or I'll put a link below as well. I hope you'll subscribe while you're there. Let's say there's a hundred boats out there that you can pick from. There are literally thousands, but for ease of use, let's call it a hundred. You need to narrow that down to the best two or three boats for you. We'll do a case study afterwards and put all this to practical use. But the first thing we need to talk about is what do you need? And the first question of what do you need is depth and weight. Depth of the keel can be a factor for a lot of sailors based on where they plan to use the boat. The lake I'm racing in tonight, for example, is fairly shallow. You wouldn't want a keel of more than about six feet where I'm going. If you plan to bomb around, let's say, the Florida Keys on your adventures, you might want to aim toward four feet as a maximum. Or if you're like a lot of scallywags and headed for the Caribbean, you have to consider the Bahamas. And most will say that six foot is the maximum depth. And that's a reasonable limit. You'll be able to get to about 90% of the Bahamas with a six foot keel. But I did the Bahamas with a little over a five foot keel and I was able to go to Norman's Key, which to date is the most beautiful place I've ever been to on our wonderful planet. And the boat I was running with as my buddy boat, Barefoot 2, a Catalina 36, had a six foot keel and they weren't able to come with me to Norman's Key. Now I scraped bottom a few times getting in and it's an uncharted pass, so you can only do it at the highest tide. If, however, you plan to sail the Mediterranean or maybe cross the ocean, you might lean toward more of a seven foot keel or even bigger. The stability of the boat depends heavily on how much weight you can get down as low as possible. So boats with super deep, deep keels would do a lot better on ocean passages. Something else to consider with depth are modified keels like the modified fin or the fin with bulb. Catalina, Hunter, all the big names offer about a five foot deep modified fin that you can use to get to all the cool places in the out islands of the Bahamas, but they also have a bulb at the bottom, sometimes with wings, right at the bottom of the keel in an effort to get the maximum amount of weight down as low as possible. And those keels are a pretty nice compromise. A side note, when you look at boats for sale, let's say Yacht World, many of the brokers will pull the specs of the boat from sailboat data, and there's an interesting caveat to that data. Sailboat data always lists the keel depth near the top of the page as the maximum keel depth for that boat, the biggest keel that boat came with. If the boat came with the option of a shorter keel, it's listed down at the bottom of the page in the fine print. And selling brokers tend to list the max depth that they find on sailboat data, while 90% of the boats they're listing don't actually have that keel. Look at the pictures of the boat. If it has a shorter keel when it's out of the water, you can see it. Um, and often with a, a bulb or wings at the bottom, you know that that's not the seven foot option. That's gonna be about five feet. A lot of them are just shy of five feet. 
Under the what do you need category, we also have to talk about weight. Most people don't think about this, but the weight of the boat is a huge factor when it comes to safety and comfort. There's a reason ocean crossing blue water boats are all 30,000 pounds or more, while a lake boat is around 10,000. A heavy boat will weather the rough seas better and be able to handle a lot worse if you get caught out at sea in a gale. But consider also the comfort factor, not just at sea, but at anchor. The heavy boat will be a lot more still and the motion it has will be a lot more sea kindly for the more squeamish people that tend to get seasick. Also, as a general rule, the lighter boats are usually faster. That 35,000 pound island packet may be super comfortable and ultra safe out in the middle of the Atlantic, but there's a reason that it stays at the dock on race nights. Conversely, the CNC 35 that just ripped past you at Mach 1 only weighs 11,000 pounds and shouldn't dare be caught out in a gale. My personal rule for Caribbean cruising or coastal sailing the bottom limit for me is about 18,000 pounds for that job. It's a happy medium for me, and I'm a racer who also wants to be comfortable. If I'm crossing the ocean, however, I'm aiming more toward 30, 35, 40,000 pounds. On race night, however, the lighter the better. The next thing to talk about is how new a boat has to be, and that really depends on two things. First, finance and insurance and we could go miles into those two things but let's keep it super simple for today financers really don't like to work with boats it's the very definition of a risky investment a boat obviously can sink but it can also be lifted up or stored incorrectly a sailboat can hit bottom and damage the structure of the keel sailboats are extremely weak if you really think about their overall structure and it's really easy to break them a financer will often insist that the boat is no more than 20 years old, so it really does narrow down those 100 boats or 1,000 boats that you might look at. But also consider that a financer will often insist on the best possible insurance policy from an approved company, usually the most expensive company and the most expensive policy. And then that insurance company will have their own list of requirements and recommendations, not just for the age of the boat, but where you're allowed to sail it. You won't be allowed to say, go to the Caribbean or leave the mainland US during hurricane season or go north too much above Maine during the bad season up there. The insurer will also have a set of intervals for when the standing rigging that holds the mast up needs to be replaced. Whether it's worn out or not, they don't care. Often 10 to 12 years and that's a pretty big expense. The other thing that weighs in on the age of the boat is your willingness to work on it. Like cars and houses, the older boat often needs a lot more care and labor and with age. Well, the newer boat may need a lot less and is more likely to be found in sort of a turnkey or near turnkey condition. Newer boats also have more innovative designs with better engine access a lot of the time, access to the steering things like that. And you can often find a full wiring and plumbing diagram for these older boats, whereas an 80s boat has been rewired and replumbed so many times it's just spaghetti. And when something goes wrong, trying to trace it down and figure out where the wrong thing is, is almost impossible. The last question I ask on the what you need subject is where will you sleep? Now, it might sound like a silly question, but if you do plan to live on the boat for more than a weekend, having a good, comfortable place to sleep is extremely important. Nothing has ruined the dream of sailing quicker than an uncomfortable boat. And maybe you're the type that's cool with a single berth in the main saloon. Maybe many people are, but more likely you're a couple and having a relaxing place to sleep is gonna be critical, not just to your comfort, but also to the longevity of your marriage, trust me. And you may see the V-Birth as the solution, but if you ever plan to anchor in the islands or anywhere in the Caribbean, there's something that you should know. A sailboat will generally point into the wind at anchor in most conditions and thus into the waves. As you try to sleep right up at the front of the boat in the bow, the waves will lift and drop the boat all night long, 
fairly rapidly and sometimes with an elevation change as much as 6 feet or more can be very uncomfortable. I find the best place to sleep in a sailboat is usually sideways midship right above the keel. It minimizes the movement of the boat almost completely. But of course that's the living room in most boats and usually not a good option. So the aft cabin seems to reign supreme when it comes to a comfortable place to lay your weary head after a long passage. The question then becomes, is a sideways bed in the aft cabin okay for you? If it's sideways, whomever gets in first would have to climb over the other person to get out in the middle of the night when duty calls. If that matters, you may want an island bed layout. Um, it's where the bed has walkways on either side and it runs the same direction on the, as the boat to maximize your comfort and the comfort of your marriage. I want to take a second to thank the patrons of this channel. You make it possible for me to make these videos. You really do. I certainly couldn't do it without you. If you want to help support this channel and these videos and help other people get into this beautiful sport of ours, please consider becoming a patron. There are a lot of opinions out there on what size boat is right for what situation. Will you be single-handed? Will you need a crew? How big is too big and how small is too small? We're going to dive into that and I'll give you some insight on what people are actually using, the people out there actually doing it. What boats will you find the most of out in the tropics? But first, what's the boat used for? In my race tonight, the biggest boat is going to be a Legend 37. Heck of a fast boat and one of my personal favorite lake boats. 37 is plenty big for inland lakes and there's enough room inside to really live on the boat if you had to. But living on a boat full time successfully really does come down to comfort and never discount that. Never let anybody tell you otherwise. The key word there is successfully. Anybody can live on a boat if there's a bathroom, a cot, and room to cook. But to not abandon the boat and the whole dream you have of sailing, you need to make sure you can be comfortable and otherwise the whole thing is all for nothing. So basically that means get the biggest boat you can for your situation. But how big is too big? I single hand a 35 footer and I have single handed up to a 42. I find that manageable for me if I'm alone without a bow thruster. And all this is really just well docking. When I get out to sea or at anchor, the boat might as well be 70 feet because once you're out there, you're always going to wish you bought the bigger boat. The magic number for most single handers or couples seems to be between 38 and 42 feet for that coastal sailing or headed to the islands. The number for inland lake folk seems to be 32 to 36 feet, but you have to get on some boats to really feel them out. I talk to a lot of people who have no idea what size boat and I always give them the same advice. Look on the internet for sailboats that are for sale near you within driving distance and see what broker seems to have the most boats listed. Call that broker and tell them you have a $150,000 budget and you'd like to see every sailboat they have. Book a day and they'll be glad you called, trust me. Um, and get on as many of those boats as you can and walk around inside, walk the decks. Figure out what you can live with, what you want, and what is truly too small for you. Imagine yourself on board for extended periods. Do you have to work on board? Where does the laptop go? Where does the laptop plug in in relation to where it's going to be? And again, to reiterate, where do you sleep? There is also a notion that boats get exponentially more expensive the bigger they get, and people will tell you that all the time. And it's slightly true, but it's more nuanced than just that. Most marinas are paid for by the foot, but the difference between a 36 and a 42 is kind of negligible when you consider the vast difference in living space and sea kindliness and capability, safety and comfort just by the 42. So what makes a boat exponentially more expensive? It's the complexity. If we look at a Mel like Delos with her electric winches, electric furling, sophisticated NEMA network links for all the systems like navigation, radar, AIS, a complicated boat will be more expensive to own. Stuff breaks. 
Also of exponential added expense is when the size of the boat goes above what the local marina can handle. If it's too big or heavy to fit in the travel lift, it'll be much worse when it comes time to haul out for service. And if it's too wide to fit into a slip, like say the Oceanus 45 would be, then you'll be raked over the coals every time you try to pay for parking. As an example, the cost of ownership between say a Catalina 380 and a 42 Mark II really isn't very noticeable. Buy what you find comfortable and can safely handle with the intended crew that you're going to have. A lot of folks are scared of parking a 40 footer, but you'll find very quickly as you learn it more, it really isn't that hard. The trick that a lot of people miss while docking a big boat is just to go slow. A sailboat would well often have full steering, even at a crawl. It's got a big rudder down there. so. If you cut to neutral very early and let the weight and inertia bleed off, then it usually works out. My goal is always to have just enough inertia that the boat should come to a complete stop when I get to my slip without ever needing reverse. I always need reverse, but that's my goal. Also single-handing a big boat is just a matter of preparation, all lines led aft, so to speak, but also run a bow line from the bow cleat all the way aft to the cockpit and tie it off somewhere, and then have a stern line ready too. So when you pull up to the dock and you step off the boat, you have a bow and stern line in each hand. I can tell you that most of the boats in the islands right now too are being handled by two people, and most of them are 40 feet. 38 to 42 seems like the sweet spot for most folks, and most prefer that modified fin keel, the five foot depth, with the bulb in the wings. I really thought I was going to be able to make just one episode on this beginner's guide, but I found very quickly that it's probably going to take two. So this week we covered what you need, next week we're going to talk about what you want in the boat, and of course price. If you need help buying a boat, I dedicated a page over at ladykaysailing.com where you can go to book an hour of my time for a private chat. It's ladykaysailing.com forward slash consults. If you want to continue the discussion, we've got an amazing group of people um, over on the Lady K Sailing Discord channel, and they talk morning, noon, and night about boats. And remember, check out that Histercy episode on the greatest, biggest, and heaviest ship ever built and why it sunk. Until next week, guys, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you.